Photographers are told by Kensington Palace that enough is enough. Which is just completely unacceptable and I think like any other parent they're saying this must stop and one of the ways they're trying to get it to stop is to bring it to the public attention. We'll be getting the latest from our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell. Also this lunchtime, Lord Janner will appear in court in one hour's time after a judge threatened to have him arrested when he failed to turn up this morning over child sex allegations. Military chemical experts test for toxic gases after the massive explosions in China which left at least 56 dead. Greek MPs back a new bailout deal following an all-night parliamentary debate. Eurozone ministers are about to meet. The fish being bred especially to protect the UK's number one food export, Scottish salmon. And coming up in sport, Australia's women are in prime position at Canterbury in the Ashes Test Match. A win for Australia would mean they'd lead the series eight points to two. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. In a highly unusual move, Kensington Palace has written to the media urging them not to publish unofficial photos of Prince George, as they say paparazzi are going to increasingly extreme lengths to capture images of him. They've complained before, but never giving such detail of actions in which they say a line has been crossed, including photographers hiding in the boot of cars and using other children to entice Prince George into view. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are said to be concerned about providing a childhood for Prince George and Princess Charlotte that is free from harassment and surveillance. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell reports. He's two years old and already he's one of the most sought after and lucrative targets for photographers anywhere in the world. The level of interest in George was apparent from the moment of his birth. Hundreds of reporters and photographers gathered outside the maternity wing to get the first images of him. Since then, William and Catherine have very deliberately tried to limit George's exposure to the public gaze. His appearance last month at the christening of his baby sister Charlotte was a comparative rarity. George's antics stole the show, and that of course has driven up the market for unofficial photographs of him. Its foreign-based websites and magazines, principally in Australia, New Zealand, France and Germany, which have been publishing the paparazzi photographs, the British media has consistently rejected them. To obtain these photographs, a small group of photographers have been staking out the Cambridge's home in Norfolk and the Middleton's home in Berkshire. Officials say their behaviour has gone too far. There's been even an instance where they tried to use another child to draw Prince George into the, into the line and fire of the lens. You know, it is just completely unacceptable. And I think like any other parent, they're saying this must stop. And one of the ways they're trying to get it to stop is to bring it to the public attention and also to address it directly with the publishers of the magazines that buy these photographs. William and Catherine say they don't want their children to have to grow up behind palace walls. Hence this determined attempt to stop the snatched photographs by concealed photographers published by magazines outside Britain, which Kensington Palace say are exploiting a small child and compromising what even someone in George's position should be entitled to, a childhood without constant intrusion. Well, Nick Witchell is here with me now. Kensington Palace has complained before, but this looks different. I think it is. I think William and Catherine are angry, they're upset. They are thinking now, of course, of the time when George goes to nursery school, not that far ahead, as Charlotte becomes more of a potential target for the photographers. So this is really a, a public appeal. They are attempting to bring to the attention of the readers of these magazines, not, I should stress, here in the United Kingdom, but principally in Australia and New Zealand, France and Germany. They want to bring to the attention of the readers of these magazines what they call the unacceptable circumstances behind what are often lovely images and by doing that they would hope that they might shame the publishers of these magazines in Australia etc into choking off the market for them and if they can do that then of course these photographers and their unacceptable in their eyes tactics uh, would no longer have a place other options go to the law restraining orders under the protection from harassment act but it's very very difficult Nick, thank you very much Lord Janner will appear in court this afternoon after a judge said she would have him arrested if he failed to turn up. 
Janet, who has dementia, was scheduled to appear at Westminster Magistrates Court this morning over historical child sex allegations. After lengthy discussions in which his lawyers offered to, for him to appear via video link, it was agreed that he will have to appear in person. Our correspondent Tom Simons is at the court for us. Uh, Tom, uh, an hour away from his appearance. That's right. I mean, this should have been a routine hearing. It usually takes a minute or two. I've been in many, many hearings like this one. The defendant is passed technically from the magistrate's court to the Crown Court. The law says the defendant must attend. But this morning, the dock was again empty. There is intense public interest in this case. The court was surrounded by the media, dozens of reporters inside. It became clear right from the start that the veteran Labour politician was not here. He last spoke in the House of Lords in 2013, but four doctors have assessed him as suffering from Alzheimer's disease. A decision that he shouldn't stand trial was overturned. And after a failed appeal to a higher court yesterday, his lawyers have accepted a way must be found for him to appear. His barrister, Paul Ozin, said that Lord Janet should appear via a live video link, either from the place where he's living or perhaps from a police station. But as the legal arguments continued, the minutes ticking away, the deputy judge, Emma Arbuthnot, said she was losing patience. Turning to Mr Ozin, she said that if she wanted to resolve this, she could have Lord Janna arrested. Stop messing around, she said. You are running out of time. One option was for Lord Janna to be taken to a court nearer him. Wood Green Crown Court in North London was considered. The judge said she wasn't in favour of the idea and he had to appear here at Westminster Magistrates. Lord Jan is accused of 22 sexual offences against nine boys between 1969 and 1988 during his time as an MP in Leicester. His family have strongly denied his involvement. Now, the judge has been setting out what will happen at 2 o'clock when Lord Janna appears. She says he will not have to enter the dock. He will be able to come into the court via a rear door that's not usually accessible to the public. He can stand or sit. She will deal briefly with his case and he can then leave. And after that, the charges against him will be read out. From there, we will be heading to a Crown Court at a date in the future to be decided. And I think the legal arguments will continue. Tom, thank you very much. Tom Simons. The Chinese authorities have insisted that the quality of air and water in the city of Tianjin is safe, despite the massive explosions which took place at a warehouse storing hazardous materials on Wednesday. Investigators are still trying to determine the cause of the blasts, which killed at least 56 people, including 21 firefighters, as John Sudworth reports. Two days on and the fire is still burning amid containers holding an unknown mix of dangerous, highly toxic chemicals. But the fire crews work on and they're still removing bodies. A reception centre has been set up for the more than 3,000 people who've been made homeless. This notice board shows how two days on the authorities are still struggling to get an accurate picture of the numbers of dead and missing. They've been posted by family members looking for loved ones. This one here, the deputy chief of the Tianjin Harbour Force. They can't find him. Notice after notice looking for people who would have been in or close to the disaster. Security guards, engineers working at the site. And down here, some very poignant notices from family members looking for missing firefighters. This one 19 years old, another one 22, this one 21 years old. The big fear, of course, is that these may have been some of the first responders and they have simply yet to be accounted for. Liu Kunying was asleep in her bed when the explosion struck. Some people are, are very worried now about the toxic chemicals on that site. Are you worried uh, about the possible health effects? No, she says, I just feel lucky to still be here. This morning there was a moment of hope. This fireman was pulled alive from the rubble after being trapped for more than 30 hours. But with so many other firemen lost, the chemical warfare team has now been brought in to advise on how to tackle the blaze safely. Meanwhile, the authorities insist there is no wider public risk. Monitoring stations show that the air around the site is safe, they say. 
Well, this is the outer limit of the police cordon here, and beyond that, about two kilometres away, you can still see the plumes of black smoke rising into the air. At the scene, the firefighters are working in carefully controlled shifts to minimise exposure, and the authorities say that once the fire is out, the containers of chemicals will be dragged to a safe zone, out of the way of the heat, so they can be analysed. The big questions remain unanswered. Among them, why was a warehouse containing such dangerous chemicals built so close to people's homes. John Sudworth reporting there. Here, the first wave of ballot papers for the Labour leadership were being sent out today as the contender Andy Burnham told the BBC that fellow candidate Jeremy Corbyn's plans lack credibility. And two of the other candidates suggested voters in the contest use their votes to exclude Mr Corbyn. Our political correspondent Ross Hawkins is in Westminster. That only works, of course, if he doesn't get an outright victory on the first ballot. And it goes to show just how central he's come to the whole campaign. It's a real uh, quandary with someone as apparently popular as Jeremy Corbyn in a contest like this for the other candidates. If they attack him, they risk losing popularity. If they don't do that, they could just let him win. So perhaps it was surprising that when I pressed Andy Burnham on exactly this issue earlier today, he went on the attack. As the ballots go out for some a single question, how can you stop Jeremy Corbyn? Andy Burnham's opponents have accused him of shying away from criticising the left winger, but have a listen to his words today. I'm saying that Jeremy's plans lack credibility. It's not possible to promise free university education, renationalising the uh, utilities without that coming at a great cost. And if you can't explain how that is going to be paid for, then I don't think we'll win back the trust of voters on the economy. After another contender, Yvette Cooper said Jeremy Corbyn lacked credibility yesterday. Andy Burnham said Corbyn's critics had misread the mood of the party. His team say he's been consistent. He has questioned Jeremy Corbyn's credibility and how his policies would be paid for before. His critics, though, suggest today's very clear words show his message is changing. Two of the candidates, this Kendall and Yvette Cooper, both argued that people should use their votes to choose anyone but Jeremy Corbyn to try to make sure that he doesn't win. Under Labour's rules, voters get to choose their first choice candidate, then their second choice, and so on. The pair both want voters to pick three candidates and exclude Jeremy Corbyn. It's important that Labour Party members use their second and third preferences, uh, and I'm urging them to back either Andy Burnham or Yvette Cooper. I think it's right for people to use all of their preferences, but I'm also fighting for everybody's first preferences. I want people to vote for me, for the radical ideas we've got for the future, but also be strong enough to take the Tories on. All the while, he's planning a speech about policy, opposing austerity, spending more money. The outsider who so worries the other candidates. Now, Andy Burnham says he's the only candidate who can beat Jeremy Corbyn, although the internal data his campaign has suggests even that could take three rounds of the counting process under that complicated election. And it is perhaps a testament to the performance of Jeremy Corbyn in this campaign that a man who just a few weeks ago was at the very fringes of the mainstream of the Labour Party is now regarded in such a way that it's a profoundly sensitive thing to do to even criticise him at all. Thank you very much. Ross Hawkins there. A trader accused of contributing to the stock market flash crash in 2010 will be released on bail after the US authorities dropped their opposition to his release. Navinda Suro, who's 36, is accused of manipulating the futures market in Chicago from a computer in his bedroom at his parents' house in Hounslow. Our economics correspondent Andy Verity is outside Westminster Magistrates Court. Give us the background to this, Andy. Well, you mentioned some of the details already. It's the most phenomenal story. A 36-year-old man who's never left home, who's accused of causing a global financial panic and fraudulently obtaining more than $40 million from a computer in his bedroom in Hounslow. That's Navinda Singh Sarau, who, of course, does not go along with the US allegations, but he has been in jail in spite of being granted bail for the last four months. And the reason for that is one of the conditions of the, that bail was that he put up £5 million pounds as security. The US authorities were convinced he'd made millions of pounds. But he couldn't obtain that. He couldn't lay his hands on that cash 
partly because a freezing order had been granted worldwide on all his assets. So he couldn't access the cash he needed to put with the court to get out on bail. His lawyers have been saying now for weeks that he needs to have that condition lifted because he's granted bail, he needs to be able to get out. And now the magistrates, the district judge, has agreed that that condition should be lifted. So he'll now be free to go home to Hounslow. His bail conditions now confine him to inside the M25. And another condition also has been lifted. He was banned from using the internet altogether. Now he'll be allowed to use the internet so long as it isn't for financial trading. But we're going to have an extradition hearing in a few months. And it's that which will be the really crucial test as to the whether the US authorities are going to get their man. Andy Verity, thank you very much. It's just after a quarter past one, our top story this lunchtime. Kensington Palace appeals to the world media not to publish any unofficial pictures of Prince George. And still to come, as Japan marks 70 years since VJ Day, we hear a British prisoner of war's story. Coming up in the sport at half past, England battle through to the semi-finals at the Netball World Cup after victory over South Africa. They take on four-time winners New Zealand tomorrow. In just over an hour's time, the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry will be present as the American flag is raised above the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. It will be a historic moment. The formal reopening of the building in Havana comes more than half a century after diplomatic ties were cut between the two countries. Our correspondent, Will Grant, is in Havana for us. Will. It really does feel like a historic moment, Simon. You're right. This feels to an extent like the final full stop at the end of the long Cold War between uh, Havana and Washington. And behind me, the Stars and Stripes will be flying in just a matter of hours. John Kerry will be the first US Secretary of State to visit Cuba since 1945. And of course, this embassy has been closed since the early 60s. So it is a very important day for those of us who watch uh, Latin American politics very closely. It was This was unthinkable just a year ago. But of course, a lot has happened in that year. We've seen President Obama sit down with Raul Castro. We've seen diplomatic ties re-established. We've seen Cuba taken off the list of state sponsors of terror. And this really is the final moment which brings, that culminates all of that hard diplomacy, that hard work behind the scenes, and both sides hope at least begins to turn the page on what is five decades of hostility. Well, thank you very much. They debated all night, but the Greek Parliament has now voted in favour of a new bailout plan in what the Prime Minister, Alexis Tsipras, has called a painful but responsible decision. The vote came just hours before Eurozone finance ministers are due to approve the 85 billion euro rescue package. But it came at a heavy price politically for the Prime Minister. Our correspondent, Paul Adams, is in Athens. Paul. Simon, it's the middle of August, not a time when Greeks, let alone Greek MPs, like to stay here in the capital. But stay here they did all night, debating this country's third major bailout in five years. It was a painful, sometimes bizarre debate which raged long after sunrise. At the end of a long night in the Greek parliament, the talking went on and on. More than seven hours of passionate, often bad-tempered debate. Some members of the Prime Minister's own party pouring scorn on the New Deal. And what is the Syria independent Greek coalition government doing? After all the anti-austerity struggles they led, they are now introducing another lovely bailout. So what kind of government is this, where whatever the Greek people vote for, no matter what they fight for or what the outcome of the referendum is, yet still the bailouts always win? The Prime Minister was one of the last to speak. After the sound and fury of the previous hours, his was a sober but defiant performance. I don't regret fighting in order to defend the rights of the Greek people, this right that I believed in as well. However, I also do not regret deciding the compromise, instead of a heroic suicide for a great majority of the Greek people. A lot of weary MPs are now joining the exodus from Athens, 
as Greece gets ready for one of the biggest holiday weekends of the year. If, as seems likely, this bailout goes ahead, everyone knows there's a lot more pain coming down the road. The reforms that Greece must undertake will affect almost every aspect of economic life here. And then there's the political fallout. The rebellion among the Prime Minister's colleagues means his government now hangs by a thread. There's talk of a confidence vote as early as next week and possible snap elections in September. Well, the focus now turns to Brussels, where Eurozone finance ministers are meeting shortly to discuss the deal. There is still scepticism in some quarters, notably from Germany. But the signs are, too, that they will approve the deal. If they do, then Mr Tsipras has an awful lot on his plate, implementing incredibly painful reforms and quite possibly fighting for his political life, too. Simon. Paul, thank you very much. Paul Adams there. A cruise ship has arrived at the Greek island of Kos to house thousands of migrants and to act as a registration centre. It's an attempt to prevent a repeat of the trouble that broke out earlier this week when migrants clashed with police. From Kos, here's our correspondent, Chris Buckler. It's a large ship. It's capable of accommodating around 2,500 people. And it will be used as a reception centre for refugees, a place where they can go to get registered to begin that process of getting the documents they need in order to travel to other parts of Europe. Up to now, that work has been done in a stadium in the centre of the town, and that's where you have seen those clashes between the police and migrants. Frankly, the building isn't fit for that purpose. Now, some will argue that this is simply moving the problem from there, but something has to be done to try to tackle it. I was on the seafront this morning and at sunrise you could just see all of the people who had slept in the streets overnight on that promenade where normally you would expect tourists to walk up and down. There were families, children all lying there amid all of the luggage. This is a problem that does need to be tackled. There are piles and piles of life vests here in the harbour at course. These were all taken away from migrants and refugees who had to be rescued from the Coast Guard because they got into difficulties in the water. And, and just over here you can see some of the boats, some of the dinghies that they have been using to try and make that journey from Turkey. It's not a particularly big distance, however it is dangerous and there are risks attached, particularly when you're in a boat that's not particularly suitable. And Coast Guard ships continue coming in overloaded with people. The Greek authorities hope that today they are making a step to deal with this crisis by putting in place this ship as a registration centre. But the truth is, is this problem isn't going to go away from the streets of course anytime soon because the migrants, they keep on coming. Chris Buckler. Tomorrow the Queen will lead commemorations remembering the almost 13,000 British troops who died in the Far East as prisoners of war as the world remembers VJ Day. One of those who survived was Jim Crossan, who worked on the notorious railway line linking Thailand to Burma. Our correspondent Sarah Campbell has been hearing his story. A relieved nation celebrated Japan's surrender and the end of the Second World War. Thousands of miles away, their loved ones had been fighting not only the Japanese, but disease and a hostile jungle climate. Captured in 1942, 97-year-old Jim Crossan's war was one of hard labour. He spent more than three years in Thailand, building railway bridges and roads. People dying every day, sometimes two or three a day. And it was dreadful, yeah, dreadful. How was the treatment in general of the prisoners of war? Oh, treated as slaves. No question about it. We were, we were slaves. How do you think you survived? <laughs> Quite frankly, I don't, I don't know. Two years ago, Jim returned. The bridge he helped to build still stands. Almost 7,000 British personnel died constructing what became known as the Death Railway. We were thousands of miles away, and we ourselves felt it. We were far from home. How were we going to get out of this mess? A month before he'd left for war, Jim had proposed to his girlfriend, Jean. 
She had to wait more than two years before he was able to get this note to her, saying he was alive. Oh, I did make it home. And I told, I told Jean before I, uh, I left her, I said, I'll come back. I did, but I was changed inside. Celebrations in 1945 and 70 years on, events will be held in London to commemorate VJ Day. I'm proud I'm going to the London on that to remember all those who didn't come back. Sarah Campbell, BBC News. And there's live coverage of these 70th anniversary commemorations in a special programme tomorrow on BBC One, VJ Day 70, The Nation Remembers. That's at 10.30. It's the UK's number one food export, and it's under threat. Scottish salmon is worth about half a billion pounds to the economy, but it's just as popular with a problematic and rather ugly-sounding parasite called sea lice. Now, scientists think they've found the answer. Here's Victoria Gill. Crystal clear water teeming with life. But while we are on the west coast of Scotland, these fish are indoors in a commercial scale hatchery. In this room, we're uh, growing wrasse. They're called cleaner wrasse, being bred here for the first time for delivery to Scottish salmon farms. These fish are a specially reared weapon against a common and widespread parasite called sea lice that affects farmed and wild salmon. Sea lice is a problem for, for fish farmers. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And we do have a number of medicines that we can use, but we are looking at other ways that we can control sea lice. It takes a year and a half to grow the wrasse to a sufficient size. Then it's a case of catching them and transporting them to where they're needed. And just like the people responsible for their safe delivery, the wrasse have to take the boat out to the salmon farm. This delivery is just the start. The hope is that in a few years, batches of cleaner wrasse will be available to order for any sea farm in Scotland that needs them. There are about a million salmon being farmed at this site. Each one of these pens is 22 metres deep and has about 70,000 fish. And the team will just pour in the cleaner wrasse and they will start eating the sea lice, which would otherwise be feeding on the salmon. Sea lice are a natural parasite that live on salmon skin. And having hundreds of thousands of fish in one place makes controlling lice a challenge. There's some evidence they can spread from farms to wild fish. So the team here hopes that hungry wrasse will be an efficient, natural pest controller. When you put them in the salmon cages, they're just having a feast. It's like a kind of midnight feast. You put all this food out for them. This is a commercial scale deployment. What we've done up until now is lab-based, hatchery-based, bench-tested work. What we're seeing now is farmers saying, we actually need a million wrasse. We can't go and catch them in the wild in a sustainable way, so we want to grow them through aquaculture, and that's a long-term solution. This farm will now play a key role in this project, examining their salmon on a weekly basis to monitor how well the wrasse are doing their job and to work out the optimum number needed to keep a fully stocked salmon cage clean. And as demand for Scottish salmon from abroad continues to grow, the aim is to expand this aquatic industry while protecting the waters it relies on. Victoria Gill, BBC News, Mull of Kintyre. Now, can you picture a better way of celebrating your advancing years than by a lion swinging in a hammock with a belly full of bamboo? Well, for a certain giant panda who turns 12 today, that's exactly what's going on. Edinburgh Zoo's Yangguang, or Sunshine as he's known in English, is the elder of a panda pair which came to the UK in 2011. There are still hopes he'll breed a panda cub sometime soon with Tian Tian, but little sign of any progress on that today. Time for the weather now, and here is Louise Lear. <laughs> That's the only ray of sunshine in Scotland today, ladies and gentlemen, because lots of weather fronts across the country are being bombarded at the moment. As you can see, we've lost yesterday's sharp, thundery downpours, only to be replaced by some heavy, persistent rain. In fact, one or two places have seen uh, over two inches of rainfall since midnight. So the UK is underneath that blanket of cloud, but just look at the persistent rain that we've seen spreading up from Sussex into Wiltshire, also parts of the Lake District and Northumberland as well, seeing some very heavy rainfall. It will start to ease away through the afternoon and actually the best of the brightness today into Northern Ireland, not too bad here. A few isolated showers into northwest Scotland, but relatively quiet, albeit on the cloudy side, heavy rain into the Northern Isles. 
improving slowly but surely for the Edinburgh Festival, I suspect, into the afternoon. And even that rain that we've seen across the north of England should start to ease a little as the afternoon progresses. Wales and the southwest, perhaps a better afternoon than you saw yesterday. Slightly drier but rather cloudy. And we could just see a few sharp showers being triggered off in the southeast under 24 degrees. Some of those thundery before the rain clears through. It will continue to clear eastwards, though, overnight tonight. And under clearer skies, temperatures in rural spots are falling into single figures but perhaps 9 to 14 to greet us first thing on Saturday morning. But the weekend is shaping up to be quite a quiet one and quite a fine one. Our weather front clears away from East Anglia, maybe rather cloudy and damp first thing. This little nose of high pressure, though, builds, drying things up quite nicely. Just a few isolated showers up into the far northwest. Here a little bit fresher, 16, 17 degrees, but in the southeast corner, a little fresher than it has been, but nevertheless, we'll still see 21 degrees and still feeling a little humid before that front really clears through and we start to introduce this fresher air. Through the night, temperatures will fall away and actually in rural parts onto Saturday into Sunday morning, we could see low single figures into the far north. So a bit on the chilly side and if you're up early enough, you might see a picture just like this. Could be quite a misty, murky start to the morning. It's not expected to last. It will be a dry, beautiful, sunny day on the whole we will see some fair weather cloud coming and going from time to time but pleasant enough any showers very isolated and highs generally of 16 to 21 degrees and this theme continues into the early half of next week largely dry warm by day but if you're off on a camping holiday certainly take note cool by night that's how it's looking whatever you're doing enjoy your weekend Simon Louise thank you very much that's all from us now on BBC One it's time for the news where you are from me good afternoon